那个妹那个，妹那个，哎，我知啦，原子飞天，好、哦，嗯，我话唔系，你唔够眼，成个神能太保护，我话神能太保护，啊，我话成个铁金刚，乜铁金铁金刚啊，你又眼花啦，哦，铜头啊，犀利啊，咩话？铜头，铜头啊，铜头，我唔信，唔信呀，试呀，试呀，嘿，咦，得唔得啊？啊，我都试下啦。上钉实乸，知你害未？金邦 was a term coined by critic Sam Ho for numerous Cantonese Hong Kong films in the 1960s that portrayed strong contemporary female heroines. They were modelled on a combination of the British James Bond series and other Western productions popular in Hong Kong at the time. Shortly after the release of Doctor No, the Cantonese film industry was eager to catch up with the West, which, according to Ho, Echoed Hong Kong's broader aspirations to compete with the international economies, a goal it was actually succeeding in. The Jane Bond films evolved from the male-led urban crime thrillers that were already being produced in Hong Kong, but by the mid 1960s, the protagonists would be replaced by female actors, and films like The Black Rose and Girls by 001 began reshaping the genre. But swapping the hero's gender was not the only change. Unlike her male predecessors, she was no longer a government spy or investigator, but an individualistic and independent agent with an above-the-law superhero quality. Resembling Robin Hood, she stole from the rich and gave to the poor, a type of autonomy that echoed Hong Kong modernity during the 1960s, which, as I mentioned in previous videos, was a type of capitalist subjectivity. Financial independence and social freedom, where Hong Kong's British colonial government presented the impression that it wished to stay out of the lives of the individual as much as possible. The Jane Bond archetype was a reverberation of Hong Kong's traditional Chinese heritage merging with Western influences. Chinese cinema has always maintained a reputation for depicting heroines in their action films. Even the first martial arts film made, *The Heroine of Long River*, starred a female warrior. The *Oriole the Flying Heroine* Pulp Fiction series from Shanghai in the 1940s also depicted women characters harboring quick wits and advanced martial arts skills, which would go on to be an important influence for the Jane Bond trend. With all this considered, Jane is, in essence, the man-beating heroine that already existed in Chinese entertainment, but. Due to harsh box office demands, Cantonese cinema was forced to adapt its conventions to popular international themes for the sake of financial survival. Sam Ho also argues that Jane was a projection of the large female Cantonese audience in Hong Kong. The 1960s was a decade when Hong Kong women took advantage of the post-war economic boom and entered by the masses into the work generated on the back of the territory's industrialization. For the first time, an entire generation of women appeared to have access to financial security and social freedom. To the audience of mostly working-class women, Jane Bond's confidence provided reassurance, and her ability to kick butt satisfaction. However, Jane's ability to take on various disguises, 
the most prominent being Josephine Sial's character in The Flying Red Rose, who appears in 10 different costumes, is an abstract reflection of what the perfect woman in Hong Kong must be. She's required to easily negotiate her way through the increasingly westernised urban landscape, as Hong Kong was still a British colony, whilst at the same time remain faithful to her traditional Chinese values. Jane can leap tall buildings, hold on to a day job, usually as a cop, exercise instructor or office worker, she indulges in western popular dancing clubs and, if necessary, changes into disguises to fit into every occasion. At home she's every bit the model Chinese daughter, answering every whim to her elders or submitting willingly to her older siblings. Jane Bond was the ultimate colonial Hong Kong woman, a flexible, almost contradictory entity that harboured qualities of both the collective structures of traditional China and the capitalist individualism of the West. It's important to emphasise the Jane Bond archetype cannot be compared to what Ho phrases the Chick with Arms films from the West, where the fighting heroines are erotic beings and their appeal is blatantly phallic. This is primarily because the target audience of the Jane Bond films were not teenage boys looking for a good time, but housewives and factory women, who saw Jane more as a means of a vicarious experience and escape from their daily lives. Despite her sophistication and martial arts ability, Jane represents that of innocence and purity. Her tight black costumes might, on the surface, suggest a type of sexuality, but she's entirely asexual. More like an adolescent sister, where she doesn't dare kiss her love interest, let alone be intimate with him. Jane can also be interpreted as Hong Kong's version of the Mulan historical figure from the Han Dynasty. For those rare people out there who aren't familiar with Mulan, the story goes, after her elderly father is drafted for military duty, she disguises herself as a man and goes in his place. Her courage and prowess win her accolades on the battlefield and she became the ultimate symbol of the strong woman within Chinese mythology. Mulan has been reincarnated throughout the ages within popular culture, varying from folk tales, stage plays and pulp novels, and obviously Jane Bond being one of a long line of film updates that was particularly relevant to 1960s Hong Kong Cantonese culture. By embracing this spirit of Mulan in the Jane Bond films, which was essentially a sensationalist celebration of strong women, also brought forth the himbo. The himbo is an amalgamation of the masculine him and bimbo, which has long been a derogatory term for an attractive but unintelligent woman. The himbo is partnered up with Jane Bond as her romantic interest, but is inferior to her in almost every way that suits the plot of the film. This includes her wits, bravery and even physical strength. The himbo was the archetype of the weak submissive male characters of the time. This has often been linked to the feminization and submission of Hong Kong to the colonial powers as it became immersed within modernity. As the women spend most of their day grafting in a factory, the man is at home, no longer fulfilling the social expectations of being the family breadwinner. This alleged weakening of male representation in Hong Kong cinema has frequently been seen as a facet of a castration complex, which, within this context, refers to an anxiety of feeling emasculated, insignificant and dominated. This was an issue embedded within Chinese history, made worse in Hong Kong due to its domination via British colonialism. Over the last hundred years, China has been impacted by the West and Japan, suffering numerous national insults and misfortune. It was under this background of a weak, subjugated China that the cinema entered the country and developed. The female star was quickly established and often appeared more important than her male counterparts. But did this strong Jane Bond and weak himbo paradigm correspond with a type of female liberation or feminist progressivism? Though it may seem the case from a Western perspective, Jane is an oxymoron, what Ho called the diminutive Amazon. Small, seemingly fragile and for the most part feminine, but she's also an Amazon. A strong woman who struggles to resist patriarchal definitions and modes of behaviour and doesn't attempt to either break down boundaries or explore women-centred ways of living. 
Set K argues that assessing the relationship between Chinese men and women should be avoided from a Western context, as the theoretical idea of binary gender has developed in vastly different ways throughout Chinese history. On a practical level, China has often regarded women as inferior. However, on a purely philosophical level, it's emphasised that women and men are in fact equal, which correlates with the dual symbolism of the yin-yang balance. This could explain why Chinese history and folklore often encounter strong female characters with extraordinary powers and abilities, as it's a mode of balancing the gender power dynamic. The existence of the weak male, however, K attributes this to Chinese civilization maturing too quickly, saying, China had from an early age implemented a meritocratic system of examinations whereby one could attain office and merit by being scholars. However, in emphasising the civil strain over the martial, talented men came to be perceived as weak bookworms. By contrast, in Japan and the West, feudal societies maintained a system of inducting men into a militaristic regime. Kay goes on to explain how this had a cumulative effect on the expectations of women, as their role in society would be to accommodate this scholarly criteria of masculinity. This transformed what was expected of women in two ways. The first transformation turns a woman into someone who is even weaker than the weak man. The second transformation makes the woman into someone who is strong so she may support the weak man. When these two types are fused together, the result is the classical ideal Chinese woman. One who is both a weak woman and a night lady at the same time. One who can fight the male of the species, yet poses no real threat to him. Thus, Chinese legend is full of stories of women warriors. These women were not fighting for female liberation, but to preserve the authority of men. When a male faces danger, the female is there to save him. She defends the home and the country, so the authority of the male may be maintained. With James Bond, his principal aim is to protect democracy. But for Jane Bond, it's to protect the traditional family system. 